Hello, and welcome to Real Crime Profile. Today I'm really excited to have a amazing guest, and it's actually an anniversary uh, that we're going to talk about, but my best friend from the FBI, my longtime colleague and buddy in law enforcement, James Fitzgerald, retired supervisory special agent, is my guest today on Real Crime Profile. How you doing, Jim? Jim, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me in your uh, in your studios for this. Well, uh, I'm glad to have you. And you just pointed out something that we're going to have to deal with in that we're both named Jim. So I'm going to call you Fitz if you're going to call me Jim, and I think that'll work out pretty well. I've been known as Fitz just about my whole life, so this will work for today. Great. All right, well, can you please tell our listening audience what the significance of today is? Well, first of all, today is April uh, 3rd, 2016, and probably just about everybody in the world may be happy once they realize what this anniversary date is, except for one guy, yeah. and that is it's the 20-year anniversary of the arrest of Theodore J. Kaczynski, better known as the Unabomber. And I was uh, played in uh, very, a pivotal, a, a pivotal role in that particular investigation, and I was glad to say that I was part of that team that helped put him behind bars where he is right now. So, just so people who weren't around or weren't aware of it at the time will understand the significance of that, Ted Kaczynski was one of the longest-running serial murderers and serial bombers in U.S. history. He was engaging in a campaign of destruction that spanned over 17 years and uh, Jim Fitzgerald was actually the guy who ultimately was responsible for getting law enforcement into that cabin so they could arrest him. Yeah, I was a brand new profiler um, and I was a seasoned investigator, a police officer for 11 years and certainly a agent in New York for um, seven years after that. And the next thing you know, I'm in profiling school for 12 to 15 weeks. Jim came a few years after me, and uh, my first case was the Unabom case. And real quick, so everyone knows, Unabom, for those younger folks out there, is actually an acronym. And it stands for University Airline Bombings. Of course, he bombed some other things and people after that. But uh, that was an early code name, if you will, uh, a working name that the FBI came up with once they were directly involved in the investigation. Yeah, the FBI does like to have uh, acronyms. They like military and other law enforcement agencies. They do like to uh, sort of acronymize almost everything they do, and uh, case names, especially major case investigations, are uh, no exception to that rule. So, Jim, why don't we first talk about when you and I met? Well, it's funny you bring that up, Jim, because um, uh, as, uh, as I know you're aware, I'm uh, writing my memoir in three parts, uh, A Journey to the Center of the Mind, and um, the first book's already published, second one's about to be published, Summer of 16, and the third book I just started is my FBI career. And um, the first three chapters have a name of a guy named Jim Clemente mentioned more than once, uh, including the time that I saw you just about to walk on the FBI seal, our second day at the academy, I said, should I stop this guy or not? Because I was there a year before as a police officer in the National Academy. I so said, you knew. Let me just get, put this in context. In the gymnasium of the FBI Academy, where we trained to be new agents, there is a big FBI seal in the middle of the gym. And when you line up to do wind sprints across the gym th during any of the physical training or arrest procedure exercises, some people are unfortunate enough to line up right in line with the seal. What I didn't realize is that when I did that, when I ran across the gym and stepped on the seal, that it would cause the our PT instructor Bob Rogers. Bob Rogers, great guy, very dedicated guy, um, to sort of flip out, I would say, is a, is a mild way of putting it. And uh, I think the first time, I think he, he made me do 100 push-ups or something for stepping on it. Um, but the fact is that I'd stepped on it on the way back. So he said for the second time that I stepped on it, he made me stand there and he made everybody else in the class 
do 100 push-ups. That's the way they do things in the military and, and quasi-military agencies like the FBI. If they want you to change your behavior, they punish everybody else, and then they punish the person whose behavior needs to be changed. Well, Jim, apparently your behavior needed to be changed that day. Yeah, Bob well, Rogers saw it early on. Yes. So we did go to the, we met at the FBI Academy, and uh, we were both going through new, new agent training. Jim Fitz had been a cop in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. I had been a prosecutor in New York City, and we ended up sitting next to each other in the FBI Academy new agent class 88-2. That meant that we would be the second class graduating in 1988, although we started in November, November 16th, 1987. I remember those dates very well, uh, and uh, both of us went there with no paperwork in hand, but um, when we got there, it was confirmed we were to be hired. And then, uh, yeah, we both chose New York City. Back then, you could choose New York, and you would be uh, most likely get it. And we actually sat next to each other in those identical battleship gray old desks that the government was well known for having. Right, in New York, in New York office. So we worked together on the joint NYPD FBI bank robbery task force. And that was an awesome assignment. There was 2,000 bank robberies that year in the, in the, in the city of New York. With, ba with no jobs, too. Yes. They, when, when I'm saying 2,000, it includes people who go in with, guns and it includes people who go in with a note and say I have a gun I have a bomb a bomb in the bag whatever that is my I have AIDS I'm gonna spit on everybody yeah it really got it really got nasty there a lot of different threats um, and uh, the teller usually hands over a small amount of money and raises the alarm so there were 2,000 such incidents in the first year that we were on that squad in 1988 um, so we worked there a number of years, then Jim got promoted to the Behavioral Analysis Unit. A couple of years later, I got promoted to the Behavioral Analysis Unit, and we resumed our uh, sort of professional partnership, and we worked a wild and crazy number and types of cases. One of, at one point, Jim actually left the BAU to go to San Francisco for a long-term investigation that turned out to be the Unabom case. And of course, it was unknown subject at that point. Nobody ever heard the name Take Theodore J. Kaczynski. And um, they sent me out there. Um, they more or less asked, but in the Bureau, if you're asked, it kind of means you're being told. So they asked me to go out to uh, San Francisco for 30 days. There are worse assignments in the Bureau. And after 30 days, I was working well with the uh, folks out there, the investigators. And I told them, you know, you have a lot of written material here. You have this brand new manifesto, 35,000 words, 56 pages, and you have 13 letters or notes he wrote before that to trick people to opening his bombs to the New York Times, the, the ideologue letters I used to call them. And I said, has anybody really looked at these documents besides fingerprints and hairs and fibers and dented writing? Well, uh, you know, we took the book titles down, this, that, and the other. I said, how about giving me that assignment? Um, I'm um, an avid reader, I like language, I do crosswords, and I play Scrabble. And you would go on to get your master's in forensic linguistics, right? I had a master's in psychology already, but then this, this really sent me off in the direction of language science, and because it was language science that solved this case, and the first time ever in federal court, a search warrant could be used for that. So. During the course of that investigation, Jim actually utilized his interest in language and he was able to find a number of incredibly, not coincidental, but um, connecting uh, usages of language that helped actually solve this case. But before we get into that, at the same time, I remember Jim and I were both uh, sort of working away from home. It's called temporary duty in the FBI. He was in San Francisco working with the Unabomb Task Force, and I went out to Little Rock, Arkansas to do some investigation regarding this couple. Uh, what was her name again? I think it was Hillary, and he was Bill, and he happened to be the President of the United States. No, according to Hillary, they were the President of the United States together. Who knows, she may be our next president of the United States and the first female president of the United States. That mm. remains to be seen. We'll see. But 
at the time, I remember Jim actually remarking that I, since I was working the Whitewater investigation and he was working the Unabomb investigation, that we were actually working the two biggest, most notorious major cases in the FBI at the same time. And the reason why I wanted to bring that up was because at the time of our of Jim's retirement, I handed him a cartoon that had been in the New Yorker magazine. And the cartoon actually brought these two cases together. It was a picture of Ted's cabin in the woods with a couple of FBI vehicles out front. And on the mailbox it says Unibom. And there's a little uh, dialogue bubble that's coming out from the cabin. And it's an agent saying, hey, guess what I found? Hillary's billing records. And that was an allusion to the billing records that were found mysteriously in the room between Hillary's office and her gym in the White House, and she claims to have no knowledge of how they got there, but those records were had been subpoenaed years before in the Whitewater investigation, and they just happened to show up in the White House of from an unknown origin. Uh, those records were sort of inculpatory, but uh, Hillary, although she did appear before the grand jury and a grand jury was called on this on that investigation she was never indicted by the grand jury well maybe 20 years from now there'll be an anniversary show we can do about something happening with hillary uh, this we'll time see. we'll see yeah she is in a little bit of uh the midst of another big fbi investigation but we don't know what's going to happen with that because we're not in, on the inside anymore we have to sit back like everybody else and wait and see but let's get back to Ted Kaczynski. The fact is that here is a guy who nobody knew who he was, but they knew that he was smart, right, Jim? Yeah, everybody knew this guy had a great deal of intelligence, intellect. Uh, nobody or very few people uh, saw him as a PhD in mathematics, which he was, uh, someone who entered uh, Harvard University at 16 years of age. Uh, we didn't see him quite there. But what I picked up right away uh, was that he was a wordsmith. He loved the English language, and he was almost OCD about it in how he would um, how he would how he would write and what he would try to say. So that you're talking about from the letters, right? That he wrote, that he left, that he used to lure people to open up packages that were actually bombs, right? Well, they were the first two letters. They were the ruse letters, as I came to call them. They never really had names before. Then that was in uh, 82, and then again in 85, two ruse letters. Then he took off from bombing and writing uh, anything for about six years. And what was that, Jim? Well, because the iconic poster, the iconic sketch was that everyone poor less out there knows of the guy with the hoodie and the aviator sunglasses and little curly hair coming down. That was all part of his disguise because somebody at the computer store where he placed the bomb saw him describe it. Right. So at that point, what happened was he had placed a bomb um, and there was an eyewitness who saw him putting the bomb there. I believe it was hidden in a piece of two by four, right? Uh, that may have been the one before that in uh, Utah, but this was in Sacramento in okay. 1987, his last bombing of this stage. Okay, and so she saw him and uh, gave the information to a police sketch artist. They put out a sketch, a sketch of him nationwide, and as a result of that, we would later find out he went underground for almost seven years. Just about, and um, he was obviously scared, and I know from my days of handling bank robberies and any other kind of robbery or rape type case, when a sketch, when a, when a sketch artist looks at someone and draws a picture, gets ID information from it, and the person actually thinks they look like it, that's when they go underground. So we were sure at least the Unabomber was scared that he came close to getting caught. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands, or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes, no best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. 
I haven't had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. That's right. So he took a break for a number of years, but the FBI did not take a break in investigating him during those years. There were just no further clues to go on at that point. So what were you doing during that time when he went dormant? And why did he go dormant? Well, um, the FBI didn't go dormant, as you said. And the point is, um, he obviously went underground because he thought he was identified. But at the same time, um, we learned that um, guys that do this do it for a reason. And what we, as investigators, as profiles, try to figure out is, was he arrested for some other crime? Was he injured or maybe even killed as a result of one of his bombings? Or did he get married and have some kids? That's always the mystery when serial offenders stop offending. But by 1993, he was back writing and bombing with a vengeance. So when he came back, he came back with a bang, right, Jim? Well, he did, and it confused some people because uh, the Oklahoma City bombing occurred in, in 93, and some people thought that may have been the Unabomber, but he actually sent a letter to the New York Times, it was one of his first letters, saying, no, that's not his style. Right. And so there's also a theory that he came back out of hiding after all those years because of the Oklahoma City bombing, because some other bomber had taken, stolen his thunder, basically, was now terrorizing the nation in a much bigger way than Ted did. Because although Ted had some deadly and very dangerous and damaging bombs, he was not doing the kind of damage that the Oklahoma City bomb did. Yeah, and if you read that uh, letter, I think I numbered it U8 uh, or 9 or something to the New York Times, he basically abhors that type of senseless bombing. It's nice how bombers can kind of almost communicate with one another what's senseless, what's senseful. Yeah, yeah making judgments. I yeah. mean, it's senseless if you kill a whole bunch of people at once, but it's not senseless if you kill targeted people. And let's apparently. not forget. And let's not forget um, in, uh, in, in 1979, he tried to bring down an American Airlines uh, jet out of Chicago with a bomb that he put on board there with an altimeter hooked to it. Right. So that would have been his big number of over 200 people there. So he would really have no room to judge there anyone you go. in I, that regard. And a lot of people don't realize that, that he actually tried to take down a jet, a passenger jet filled with people. And probably the only reason why he didn't take it down was because he sent it through the mail. In other words, he put his bomb in a mailbox. The mailbox, he was banking on the fact that it would go air mail to, the, to its destination. And he put an altimeter in so that it would blow up while the plane was up in the air, not while the plane was on the ground. So he tried to kill people with it. The fact is that just coincidentally, his package was packed in the middle of a bunch of other mail on top, bottom, sides, and that kind of absorbed a lot of the blast. And it didn't do significant damage to the plane, although it did create a serious problem, and it could have ended up causing that plane to go down. Ironically, uh, after his arrest, I read everything that was in his cabin, and in one entry in one of his journals, he wrote, in a way, he's glad that the plane didn't blow up and go down because somehow he would have killed some grandparents or grandkids, something like that, and maybe that would have bothered him. So that's why from that point on, he stuck to representational targets, either at a certain institutions like schools or airline companies uh, and certainly computer stores and things like that afterwards. So when you look at his bombing, what do you... As a profiler, how do you classify his bombing? Well, he was certainly um, uh, he was certainly very serious in what he was doing, and like with most bombers, uh, he was getting better as he went along. And his devices early on, for his very first bombing device in uh, 1978 at the University of Chicago, it was found in a parking lot between several cars, and but it was dressed, it was mailed. It, I mean, I'm sorry, it was addressed. It had stamps on it next to a post box, and, and nobody could figure out exactly, well, why didn't you just mail it? Well, it turns out they took the dimensions of the device after it blew up, and they realized 
the Unabomber made the package too big to fit inside a, a standard mailbox. Right. So, like many criminals, he could be intelligent as hell, but not criminally sophisticated. And that means he just didn't know exactly what the perfect MO was. But is he, is he, would you call him a personal cause bomber no. or? Yeah, I mean, people have debated his reasonings behind this. Uh, I mean, I can tell you the causes. Uh, ultimately, it had to do with a sawmill opening up down the road from his house, his cabin. And it also had to do with uh, airliners flying 35,000 feet over his head. So you could certainly say personal cause, but also mix in some schizophrenia and paranoia and then and hatred of his parents, hatred of himself. Don't forget, here's a guy that got his PhD in mathematics. And about the same time he got his PhD, um, within a few years anyway, handheld calculators are coming out. And they were kind of big back then, not like the iPhones we have today, yeah. but you can still carry it around under your arm. And they could figure out the problems it would take him a month to figure out. You could do now in a matter of minutes and probably today in a matter of seconds. So all of a sudden his whole life's journey, certainly from an academic or professional point of view, is now tossed out the window. He had some sexual identity issues. These are all things we learned, of course, after the fact. He, uh, he desperately wanted a woman, but he just didn't want to go there. And then, you know, he had a lot of per interpersonal problems, yeah. right? He just didn't relate well with other people. And I think there are things in his background and so forth. And when you read Jim's book, we'll go into, he will go into great detail about this. And you'll learn a lot about how his personal behavioral issues really sort of built up inside of him and came out and were manifested in his bombing campaign. Yeah, and don't forget, and um, I know you know this, Jim, but I mean, he so disliked people, he bought, you know, five or 10 acres in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Montana to build his little cabin. Uh, he wanted no electricity, no phone lines, no running water, anything to get away from society. And he had no dealings at all with his neighbors, maybe once or twice a year. They'd pay him $50 to put some fence post in or something like that. They had no idea the guy who was doing this menial work for them was actually a Dr. Kaczynski who used to teach at Berkeley for at least two years. Yeah, so after having been educated at Harvard, he got a job teaching mathematics at Berkeley, and he quit. He just walked away from all of that to become really a perfect example of a hermit. He literally wanted to get away from society, and unfortunately, he was unable to do that. He, While he was in that cabin, they decided to open up a sawmill nearby, and he was also, as Jim pointed out, he was very disturbed by planes flying overhead, despite the fact that Flying at 30, 35,000 feet, the, the noise would be minimal. It didn't seem minimal to him. In other words, he was hyper-focused on that kind of you know, new technology, and therefore he wanted to attack the people. His targets were new technology and the people that developed them, mainly at, at institutions of higher education. Yeah, and before that, he was setting up trip wires in the woods where guys would ride their ATVs or motorcycles, and they could actually cut their heads off if they hit it right. He would put sugar in the gas tanks of the different types of derricks and trucks at the sawmill, and all because they would start buzzing away at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning. Ted didn't like his serenity being, uh, uh, you know, stepped on there, and so he didn't do anything to these people besides minor things, but he sent bombs to other people to get his frustration out. Yeah. And here's the thing, when you have somebody like this who is willing to sort of separate themselves from society, then it's a little more difficult for law enforcement to catch up with that person. He was not criminally sophisticated, but he was fairly forensically sophisticated, right, Jim? Well, he was. Um, and, and what's he... the difference between those two things? Well, obviously, a... a with criminal sophistication, you know how to successfully carry out a crime and, and, and your motivation is clear, whether it's for greed, for, for profit, or for hurting somebody. His early bombs, he didn't do so well in the sophistication part, but he got better. His bombs became more deadly as he made them. They were designed then to rip flesh, rip skin, and kill people. Um, and the other part was... 
was his forensic sophistication? He was uh, on the top of the uh, pay scale in that department because his bombs were so intricately made with nothing that could be traceable. We knew this guy was taking months to make his IEDs, bombs, improvised explosive devices. Yeah, and what's crazy about it is the simplicity of them are, were, were actually what made it more difficult for the FBI to trace him. So instead of buying materials, which is basically after a blast, the FBI bomb techs will collect all the pieces of the bomb and reconstruct it. And usually those pieces were purchased at a different, a particular type of hardware store or electronics store or whatever. And therefore we can work backwards and find out who's buying stuff at those places and actually narrow down the suspect pool. He was actually making these things on his own, wasn't he? Well, he was. And the little known secret is before this became the Unibomb investigation, this guy was known as the Junkyard Bomber for about a year. And of course, the FBI got bored with that name. But the point is, uh, before you and I were in the FBI, Jim, back in the early to mid 80s, uh, every single junkyard in the U.S. was visited by at least one FBI agent wow. at least one time saying, do you have anybody coming in? And they had pictures of parts of the devices that survived, little carved pieces of wood and metals, uh, pieces of metal. And they said, do you know anybody coming in buying this kind of stuff? And every, uh, every response was negative, just uh, no, no leads developed out of that. So as it turns out, what he was doing was going to sort of a local junkyard in, in around where his cabin was, right? And well, it's important to know this. Um, he did move to the cabin in, in Montana in 1972. He saved his money from Berkeley for two years' work, bought some property. His brother David, who we know what David's role was, he eventually turned his brother in. But David helped him build the cabin. And uh, But one, one thing about David turning him in, that wasn't the only thing that actually pointed to Ted. Actually, that was sort of the confluence of events. David did that because of, of a decision you made and fought hard for, right, to get the manifesto published. But we'll get back to that later, right? <laughs> yes, we will. Okay. So David actually helped him build the cabin. Yeah. And Ted, I read his writings, his diaries years later, and he was kind of okay in the woods for those years. But it's like um, something struck uh, Ted Kaczynski in about 1977, 1978. That is, he had to come back to Chicago, his roots. He moved back in with his parents. Uh, you know, uh, the former college professor turned hermit, as you said. And actually, it's in Chicago when his first bombings began. And his bombs were actually constructed in the attic of his parents' home in suburban Chicago. Yeah. And there was some junkyard. He would drive miles and miles to go to one junkyard to buy something, one to buy something else, or he'd intricately carve other items up. He would take batteries. He would carefully peel the skin off each battery so even the lot number could not be traced. Right, so you you wouldn't know the make, the, the model, the, the lot number of the battery, and it would be very difficult to reverse engineer that and figure out where it was purchased because of that. But he also did other things. He also got on a bus, right, with the bombs and delivered and, and basically went to other states, right? Well, he in, the, in his early years out of Chicago, he mixed uh, placing the devices and mailing the devices. And placing, of course, is a little bit easier because we just have a plunger on the bottom. As soon as somebody picks it up, it goes off or maybe a little timer. Uh, mailing, you have to make sure it makes it through the mail, gets to its destination, and when the person actually pulls the, the wrapping off and opens the box, takes the tape, all that stuff off, that's when it blows up. So uh, he was mixing both um, placing and uh, sending, I should say mailing back then, all with numerous stamps. Of course, he never walked into a post office and said, oh, here, weigh this for me, and uh, you know, I'll pay you the $4, whatever it costs. He made sure he bought 4 to $10 worth of stamps. He would lick each one. And he got a little bit clever along the way, and he, it was in the media that there were no real clues or there was no real evidence on his bombing devices. So um, one time, lo and behold, in the laboratory, uh, the uh, technicians there are taking one of his devices apart. It blew up, but they're taking the remnants of it apart. And guess what they find under this, one of the stamps? A blonde human hair. Yeah, and that would seem, if it was placed, the, the stamp was obviously placed on there by the bomber, you would think. So that would give us an important lead. 
and this is a little before the days of DNA, but still you could do class evidence, et cetera, with the type of hair. And of course, you could say someone has blonde hair, if it's natural color or not, you know, animal versus human, who's a human blonde hair. And a lot of time and effort went to that. And people for years uh, thought the Unabomber had blonde hair. But guess what? When we read that diary years later, we found out when he was on one of his bus trips to mail one of his packages, it turns out that uh, he happened to find a blonde hair in a public men's room at a Greyhound bus station somewhere. He picked it up. He put it in a little envelope, whatever he had with him. And then, you know, a day or two later, when he was putting all the stamps on his bombs on the package, that's when he put the little piece of hair underneath just enough to throw off the FBI. Right. So that is what we call a forensic countermeasure. In other words, a deliberate piece of forensic evidence that is left there. Now, how could he know? He would never be able to know whether that stamp and that hair would actually survive the blast. But it did survive the blast, and it did throw off the FBI for a number a number of months. However, there are a number of other false leads, red herrings in this investigation, and we're going to get right to them in a minute. So what were the other um, red herrings that uh, the investigation went off on? Well, when he started writing to the New York Times in 1993, remember, all we know is the Unabomber. We don't have any uh, any name on anybody. And uh, he would he would end each letter so the New York Times knew it was authentic and it was really him with a... Um, nine-digit number, which happens to also, with the dashes in it, look just like yours or my Social Security number. So it's three digits, a dash, two digits, a dash, and four digits. So that's the bottom of this letter. Now, nobody in the FBI thought our serial bomber was actually putting his real Social Security number. But, gee, what could this be? And we still have to check it out. So the FBI, of course, uh, through their uh, records and through Social Security, tracked it down. And it could have been a Social Security of almost number of almost anybody, uh, you know, uh, a nun, a priest, uh, a doctor, a lawyer, a kid, you name it. In this particular case, it so happened to come back to a man serving time in the California penal system. So he was actually a convict. Was he a bomber? He was not a bomber. Uh, he was a low-level drug dealer, car thief, and just kind of just a guy that do three years in, gets out, four years in, gets out. So, of course, the FBI felt, we got to talk to this guy. Somehow his number, if it is a social number, is being used by the Unabomber. And they knew it was him because the Unabomber's writing about other things he's done, whatever. So they go out and interview this guy, and they spend, you know, a few hours with him doing all the background they can. They confirm that was his number. And basically, they, you know, walked it through slowly. Have you heard of the Unabomber? Do you know anything about bombings? Blah, blah, blah. Nothing in his background like that. But eventually, they, you know, they said, do you know who the Unabomber is? And he said, no, agents, but I'll tell you what. You get me out of prison, I'll find them for you in a week. <laughs> and the agents go. came back and said, I'll tell you what. You tell us who the Unabomber is, and it is him. Then we'll work on getting you an early release. There you go. Yeah, obviously, he was just making a play for it like any good, slick convict would. So what about the other uh, major red herring in this case? In yet another letter uh, sent to the New York Times, uh, the FBI eventually took it. And at this point now, the Unabomber wants to get his manifesto published. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But these early letters were kind of setting up that whole stage. So, of course, every letter was turned over to the FBI by the New York Times. And it was, in fact, sent to the lab. And the typewriter um, font is matching up every single letter, even the early ruse letters from uh, from uh, the early 80s, uh, 1980, 1985. Yeah, so every and, the, and just the FBI would be tearing this apart. They would be seeing where the paper came from, where the ink came from, what, what kind of typewriter it was, and all this stuff. But that was leading nowhere. However... Well, they had it in the lab, and they put under their special lights with microscopes and all that stuff. And lo and behold, what do they see on the piece of paper itself, invisible to the naked eye, but visible through you know, ultraviolet lighting and those types of things, is a simple four-letter, um, four-word message. And that is, call Nathan R. Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Uh and the FBI said, whoa. This was in indented writing, by Indented the way. writing, invisible right. to the naked eye, but the laboratory picked it up. 
And it was clear, and anybody who knows about and then in writing, maybe as a kid, you'd put one piece of paper over top of another, you write on it, you throw the top piece away, and you have a secret message on that bottom piece of paper. So in a way, they, that's what they had here. And they figured the Unabomber finally made a mistake with, with all the non-evidence and all of his bombing devices, including all of his writings up to this time. We finally may have a clue. So, as you can imagine, Jim, and we've all covered leads, something like this in our agent days, uh, this went out to every division in the U.S., 56 of them, and they said, contact and find every Nathan R., R period, middle initial, or R last name. as their last name. Interview him and find out if they know anything about the Unabomber. Right. They're pretty sure this is not the Unabomber himself, meaning Nathan R., but we still have to get to the bottom of this lead. So there are thousands of people with the names Nathan R. something or Nathan R. as their first letter of their last name. So FBI agents spread out across the country and interviewed every single one of these guys. As it turns out, what was the deal with that lead? Yeah, and just a throwback just to remind people, this was before Internet days, and it wasn't quite as easy to look these things up, phone books, other directories. Bottom line is, no Nathan R. came up. But before we even solve that part of the clue, there's a DJ who has an evening talk show in Colorado. And he's on every night from like 6 to 9. His name was Nathan R. something. I actually forget his last name after all these years. He was convinced he was the Nathan R., that was supposed to be called at 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night. So this enterprising DJ, for either legitimate reasons or to boost his ratings, who knows, he said, from now on, everybody, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, the lines are dead except for the Unabomber. And he waited for like four weeks in a row for the phone to ring, and all you heard is crickets in the background, of course, and uh, some crank callers, you know, hey, I'm the Unabomber, go, you know, blankety blank. Uh, it turns out that was a all false lead because when the agents finally said, we've got to go back to the very beginning, which, as you know, Jim, sometimes in crime and criminal investigations, you've got to do that. They go back in time and they interview the actual guy who opened the letter at the New York Times. He had since moved on to a different department. And they said, look, we just got to tell you, you opened this letter, right? Yeah, I did. And you then turned it over to him. Well, yeah. Did you write a note to yourself? or Well, what do you mean? Do you know a Nathan R? Yeah, I have a good friend, Nathan R. Would you maybe have called him that night or Wednesday night? It turns out it was the copy boy, mailroom boy, whomever at the New York Times who wrote a letter to himself, note to himself, put it in his pocket. He wrote it over top of the Unabomber's letter before he opened the letter. It was sitting. The letter was sitting in a pile on his desk. He was going to go deliver these letters to the people they were addressed to. Takes out a notepad. Puts takes out a note piece of paper, writes, call Nathan R. 7 p.m. on that note, but it was sitting on top of that letter when he did it, so the indented writing went on to the letter, and there you have it. Thousands of FBI agent man hours wasted. Not really wasted, because you have to check out every lead, but in the end, it turned out it went nowhere. Yeah, at one point, Louis Free, our director back then, even went to the public airwaves and said, everybody, we need your help. If your name is Nathan R. Anything, as I explained before, middle, last, could you please contact your local FBI office? You're not in trouble. We just need help on an investigation. They did get people actually calling right. up, but it all went nowhere, of course, right. when the copy boy was finally interviewed. So we've been talking about forensic countermeasures and false leads that they produced. What about linguistic countermeasures? Well, it wasn't until I got involved in the case, and I said uh, to the bosses there, and they were great bosses uh, that worked the case, Jim Freeman, Terry Turchie, and I said, uh, Max Knoll was one of the investigators. I said, look, let me, you guys have done all the fingerprints, you've re-interviewed everybody, you've done this, you've done that. Have you really worked with reading the actual documents from a content analysis perspective? Well, not really. We know there's some books he mentions, and there's a place or two. Okay, let me focus on that as a brand new profiler. I was not a linguist at the time, just to remind you and the listeners, Jim. Right, uh, you weren't actually a degreed linguist, but it was your hobby. You did love language and linguistics, and you played word games all the time. It was a focus that you just naturally had in your life, right? It was, and actually when I got into this case, I sat down and read the first 20 pages of the dictionary. 
I don't mean where it starts A, I mean the stuff before that, where it just tells you it breaks down language from the different language families, Proto-Indo-European, which of course is English, it comes from Germanic, and I walk through all of that to just learn to the best of my abilities how language works. I, I know certainly informally, most of us do, but from a more formal perspective. Well, that is a very unique perspective I wanted you to know, Jim. Not everybody, and I'm sure our listeners, if you want to weigh in on whether or not you have ever read the first 20 pages of the dictionary, I know I haven't. So That's before the letter A, just to make it clear. There you go, before uh, the letter A. All right, so linguistic countermeasures. Yes, so one of his letters to the New York Times, it wasn't the same one we talked about. It was one coming up later. Um you know, I, I'm going to stand by. That was this actually a letter to Dr. Galerter from Yale University. Um, basically, the very first sentence was, I guess people without advanced degrees don't count, period. Then he goes on to some things about technology and the evils of computer science. But think of that first sentence. I guess people without advanced degrees don't count. Jim, I would ask you, if you just read that on the surface, you're not a profiler. The author, does he have an advanced degree or not? He's trying to say that he does not. He is trying to say through an implicit style, not explicit, implicit, he doesn't. About six lines later, he puts a, a line in there, very, very similar. I guess if you don't have a college degree, you're not, con you're not considered smart, something like that. And he's almost saying the same thing as if, well, look at me, the author. I don't have a college degree. And uh... people, people were building their profile or their investigative leads on that. And I looked at this, and I read every single thing he had written at that point, the manifesto only once or twice in my first month there. And that one letter, those two lines stuck out as, yes, uh, linguistic countermeasures, uh, um, what I also called contraindicators. Why would he put something biographical in here? Twice. Twice in the same letter. And somebody who's so careful not to give any, away any clues. And that seems a little bit, I'm sorry I can't take off my profiling hat right now, but that seems a little bit like overselling. Why didn't he just say it once? Why did he say it twice? And didn't you recognize something about the manifesto itself, the format of it? Well, yes. When I finally, I tried to read these letters in order, and the, the first 13 were just one or two pages, relatively simple. Um, although very well written, as I said, all typed on a 1934 Underwood typewriter. Finally, the manifesto comes in, and I read that, uh, 56 pages, 35,000 words, 212 paragraphs, 26 notes. And you know what? He numbered each paragraph. Are you getting the feeling that Jim Fitzgerald is a little OCD when it comes to words? Come on. And some numbers there, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I read every single word of his backwards, not literally backwards, but I would start at the 50th chapter sometimes. The next day, I'd start at the 100th chapter, so I'm fresh. And uh, yes, it was formatted like a 1950s or 1960s dissertation or thesis. Like a doctoral thesis. One could say that. Right. Okay, so here is the actual format that's actually leaking out information that is trying to be contradicted in the text itself. That's where forensic linguistic profiling was born, right? Uh, I would say it certainly nurtured its way and, 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 uh, and hit its uh, near its peak at that point. Um, but the point is, I just knew something wasn't right about this. I knew there were clues in there that nobody else was looking at. He had corrections pages. The first three pages of his manifesto, its title was, of course, Industrial Society. Um, and, you know, it was all about industrial society. And it was about how it ruined the, uh, the world. Right. And his theory was everyone should live uh, industrial society in his future was the name of the uh, of his manifesto, which he never used that word. The media gave him uh, gave it that name. He just called it his article. Right. So it went on about we should be living in an agrarian society of groups or tribes of 30 people or more living off the land. And since nobody was willing to do that, he had to bomb and kill people to remind them that's the way. Well, obviously, that's faulty logic. It's actually uh, incredibly uh, criminal. It's incredibly brutal to do what he did. In fact, why don't you tell us about the last two packages that he sent? Yeah, the last two were particularly brutal. He was definitely getting, he was definitely becoming a better bomber at this point. And in November of 1994, a, a marketing executive in North Caldwell, New Jersey, received a package on a Saturday afternoon. It was overstamped, handwritten on the box, tape all around it. And his wife and young daughters are right there. 
Uh, Tom, do you recognize this? Uh, who would this be from? I don't know. Uh, let me take a look at this. He walks from whatever, the living room, the lobby, wherever he was with his wife and two young kids. He walks over into the kitchen, opens it up there, it blows up and rips him in half. Right. So it would have killed his entire family. And just, you know, by the grace of God, I guess, or chance, he didn't actually kill the, the, the wife and children. And then the next one is actually a little ironic, huh? It, it, well, it is in a, in a very deadly uh, usage of the word. But um, at this point, um, you know, the media is all over this Unabomber person. The post office is putting notices in post offices. I think they're even sending it through the mail to different businesses. If you see overly stamped boxes with handwriting on them, you don't know who they're from. Do not open it. Call us. We will come and take it and open it. Lo and behold, a, uh, a forestry lobbyist in Sacramento, California, comes into work one April morning in 1995, and uh, he opens uh, and he walks in, his two secretaries, oh, Mr. So-and-so, you have a box here, and it's kind of lots of stamps, and it's, uh, you know, I don't know who this is from. The guy jokes out loud and says, huh, maybe it's from that Unabomber guy. And the women kind of snicker. He walks into his office, opens it up, it was, in fact, from the Unabomber, and it killed him. Yeah, so that's a very, very tragic day. And unfortunately, we were no closer to catching Ted Kaczynski at that time. But because of the manifesto... And forensic linguistics. We did catch him. We'll be right back to talk about that. So now we're actually at the point of the story where... Ted has sent the manifesto into the New York Times, right? Yep. And he wants it to be published. Now, the New York Times doesn't want to publish it. And he should, actually, internally, in the FBI, there was a lot of debate on the task force about whether or not we should sort of succumb to the threats of the Unabomber. And a actually, terrorist. Yeah, he was definitely a terrorist. He was a murdering terrorist, and we didn't. nobody really wanted to do it. What did you argue? Well, um, I argued it should be published. I said, get it out there, word for word, don't violate. Remember, the deal he wanted with the New York Times was, uh, you publish my article, again, he called it an article, and uh, I will cease from bombing to kill any, any more. However, he put a little caveat in there, I do reserve the right to bomb for purposes of sabotage. Now, I'm not sure what that means, bring down radio towers or something, whatever. Uh, he would more or less cease killing. But, you know, the New York Times wasn't the only one who received a copy. Some other people did, too, including Penthouse Magazine. And because if the New York Times, the New York Times was debating on its own pages whether they should publish this or not. So the public was kind of brought in on this. Uh, there was only one or two, like, cable shows at the time that was covering things like this. I think it was Nightline on one of the uh, broadcast networks. And they'd go back and forth, should we accede to the demands of a terrorist? Right, but you came up with a very critical need that we needed to publish it because if we could get it out there, what? Someone will recognize his writing style because as I learned later as a linguist, we all have distinctive idiolects and that's a linguistic term for a personal dialect. Like an individual dialect. It is, it's spoken language as well as written. Now three words, you can't tell a whole lot. You have 30,000 words, and uh, you can tell a lot more. And that's what we had at a, at a minimum with this guy. Right. So you decided that that was the thing that we were going to have to do to get a lead. In fact, it was published. At the time, they were actually, we're not going to get into too much details about that, but they were actually staking out places that sold these newspapers to see if he would come and get a copy and so forth. But the real reason was to see if somebody out there recognized this kind of writing and this kind of ranting, and in fact it worked, because Ted Kaczynski's sister-in-law was reading it in London, if I'm not mistaken. You're close, Paris. Paris, okay. <laughs> and she called up Ted's brother and said, I think this is Ted. And, Te and then his brother actually came in to the FBI and reported that he thought it was his brother. Well, that's the short version of the story. Yes, There's a lot very, of stuff in there. Lots of stuff. But the important thing is, what were you doing actually before his brother came in? I was looking at every piece of written material that anything, 
even resembled this manifesto. Including? Including doctoral dissertations from the 50s and 60s. This helped us age the Unabomber. His profile, his profile earlier was as a college student in 1978 with that first bomb at the University of Chicago where it didn't fit in the mailbox. But no, he was already in his uh, late 20s at that point, and we had to age this guy a little bit more. And uh, we, in fact, did. And uh, it helped us put more of a perspective on this. And lo and behold, it gets out there. And I got to tell you, in the summer of 95, near the end of 95, at the Unabomb Task Force, we had 2,500 different suspects. Not all were named. Some descriptions. Some a guy driving the BART, you know, in San Francisco, Metro, wherever. A lot of ex-husbands are in there, lawyers. And, and yeah, there were a lot of people who called in yep. tips on people they just hated and wanted them to get in trouble. So there was a lot of false leads in that. But Jim was painstakingly going through every doctoral thesis he could get his hands on in the mathematics and science areas so that he could try to match that up with the manifesto. When Ted's brother came in and put him in the pile of suspects, Jim went through that. Both his doctoral thesis, Ted's doctoral thesis, and the manifesto. And also a magic 23-page document that Ted wrote in the early 70s, sent it to David, which was essentially an outline in exact order of the manifesto. So, so we had this letter, this document, 23 pages written by Ted Kaczynski, turned over to us by David Kaczynski. And he's and I know nothing about any names at this point. I'm actually back at Quantico. My boss has called me back to work some other serial murder and serial killer cases. I look at this document, and lo and behold, I call up the task force people, uh, SAC, Jim Freeman, special agent in charge, and said, uh, unless this is an elaborate forgery, Someone took the manifesto in the newspaper and then typed, you know, a version out of it uh, or this 23-page document. You've got your guy. I use those exact words. Right. You've got your guy. So then what Jim did at that point was basically go through the manifesto and Ted's doctoral thesis. And basically he made a linguistic comparison matrix, right? Well, it wasn't just his thesis. Well, it was his... 178 documents the family eventually turned over to us. I was brought back out to San Francisco. So this was a, an investigation that happened. In other words, somebody comes in and says, yeah, my brother's the Unabomber. That doesn't get the Unabomber arrested. We have to covertly now still do a major investigation. So all these documents. But this was the first time in the history of law enforcement anywhere where a serial bomber, a serial murderer was actually captured and arrested based on his use of language. This was, this was a turning point in the history of law enforcement, and Jim Fitzgerald is the one who did it. I mean, not because he thought it was going to change law, change history, or, or change the way law enforcement did work, but because of his interest in language, his insights into language, and it would drive him on to get a master's in forensic linguistics from Georgetown University. So... He, after having made those lists of and comparisons of the t of the documents that he had, he was able to put that into an affidavit for a search warrant. Fifty pages long, six hundred and twenty-five separate comparisons. I didn't render one opinion in my report. I was not an expert. I knew enough about the court system that I could be challenged on that. But it was for a judge to read and make his or her own mind up. The judge in Montana did, in fact, read it, a federal judge, and said, you know what? These all uh, match up here, including this one particular phrase, who would write, you can't eat your cake and have it too? Well, I found that in the manifesto. If you notice, the verbs are transposed there. From what we usually say, we usually say you can't have your cake and eat it too. There it is in the manifesto. And I actually thought, wow, I found his first mistake. This is so cool. It doesn't mean anything right now in the early days, but guess what? D uh, David Kaczynski calls. Ted Kaczynski, his brother, is identified. Fine, send us some writings. There's a 1972 letter he wrote to the uh, Saturday Evening Post that his mother saved. We have it, and it's signed Theodore Kaczynski at the bottom. And guess what? At the very end of his three-paragraph letter to the editor, blah, 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 but you can't eat your cake and have it too. And I remember... Bingo. I remember we, us having this conversation, and I also remember being in a... In a uh, playing a word game with my brother, Tim, who was like incredibly fastidious about rules and stuff in these games. And he had looked up that, that, that quote as well. And the original quote is actually... The 15th century proverb, 
actually reads as, you know, ye cannot eat ye cake and have it too, something like yeah, that. Something the like point that. is, the Unabomber had it right. Yes. We all say it wrong, but it didn't matter. Yes. It was evidence. That's it's awesome. the context of how language is used, which makes it valuable in an evidentiary sense. Right. So that led to the search warrant at Ted's cabin when law enforcement knocked on the door and got him out of there. They found a bomb sitting there all all completely manufactured, wrapped in aluminum foil, if I'm not mistaken, which I think is the last stage that he does before he wraps it in paper to mail it or hand deliver it. And they actually were able to arrest Ted Kaczynski, ending the entire terror spree, 17 plus years, by the Unabomber. 16 bombings, three dead, dozens injured, almost 212 killed if the flight went down. Right. So it, w it was an amazing thing that you did, Jim, and I'm proud to have been your colleague at the time and certainly very happy that we're friends still after all these years. So later on, though, while he was in jail, you did try to go visit him, didn't you? Yeah, the quick version of the story, I'm at the U.S. Air Force Academy doing some lecturing, so I'm already in Fort Collins, Colorado. And a month before, I reached out to the uh, prison people in the, in the Supermax in Florence, Colorado. I said, hey, I uh, helped put this uh, Ted Kaczynski in jail uh, a few years ago. How about I come out and visit him? Let me see. Back and forth over a bunch of phone calls, Dr. Kaczynski would be willing to see me. Real quick here so you know, Jim, I know you know this, but for your, for your listeners, Supermax is 23 hours a day by yourself in a cell about 10 foot by 10 foot, coincidentally the size of his cabin. He gets out one hour to take a shower, maybe work out, and he's back in. So this is what the Unabomber's life is like every right. single day now. So I'm finally out there. I finish up my duties at the Air Force Academy. I'm driving south on the interstate. I get a call from the uh, correctional officer. And it's all arranged to meet him like 11 o'clock that day. He said, oh, Mr. Fitzgerald, Agent Fitzgerald at the time, uh, yeah, uh, the meeting is not going to happen. I said, well, what happened? Well, Mr. Uh, Dr. Kaczynski told me he wants to give you a very specific message. He wants me to give it to you. I said, okay, what's that? He said, he'd love to meet with you, Agent Fitzgerald, but he's very busy today. <laughs> now, this is a little bit of Unabomb humor, and this is a little way to stick it back to me, the guy he knows helped put him in prison. Yeah, well... Maybe one day he will talk to you, but we'll see. But in the meantime, we have some great news, some amazing news. And since this case happened, Jim and I have been talking about it. And what many people don't know is that while we were in the academy, Jim and I, Fitz and I, put together, I guess we were a little bored. Um, we decided to put together sort of a video um, sort of mocking or, you know, at least having fun, having fun with our experience at the academy. And so we, we made a video, we used, we brought in all of our classmates and even some of our teachers and counselors and so forth. It was really, it was really a lot of fun. Well, that would be foreshadowing for what we would do now. And since we retired, Jim and I have been working really hard. We teamed up with Tony Gittleson, another writer. Tony and I uh, wrote a pilot called Manifesto, about the hunt for the Unabomber based on Jim's story and all the work that he did. We teamed up then with Trigger Street, Kevin Spacey's production company, and we sold the project to Discovery. And you may have noticed in early April that Discovery Channel actually announced that Manifesto is going to series. So shortly, you'll be able to watch actors portraying Jim Fitzgerald and the heroic work he did in order to bring down the Unabomber. It's a wonderful thing. It's an amazing thing. You should be really proud of yourself, Jim. I'm proud of you. Well, thank you, Jim. And um, all this will be in my book, A Journey to the Center of the Mind. There's one out there already, another one to be published. And uh, we're going to cover a lot of this stuff in the third book as well as, uh, and you'll see it on the Discovery Channel too at some point when it comes out in 2017. So, we're very happy to have this opportunity at Real Crime Profile to bring in Jim Fitzgerald, and hopefully we'll do this from time to time. We'll have Jim come back. We'll have other experts, people that I've worked with, people that I've interacted with, people that Laura Richards has worked with and interacted with, and we will actually keep you informed on the cases, the behind the scenes of the cases that you never knew about. Thank you very much for listening to Real Crime Profile. 
For advice or support, if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0207 840-8960 or go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2247 In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter, safety or counselling, call the Genesis 24-hour hotline 214-946-4357 or go on the website www.genesisshelter.org or you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline on 800-799-7233. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan, engineered by Jacob Moose Molin. Music is composed and performed by Simba Sumba. Logo art by Rob Cohen. Real Car Profile is produced and recorded at Empire Studios LA by XG Productions. 